Welcome. If you are fortunate enough to be sitting down, congratulations. And if you're not, and you're viewing this from the overflow room, welcome to you also. Wes Jackson's presentation is being videotaped and will be aired on JCCC television, as well as made available on our website. So please spread the word among those whom limited space could not accommodate that this talk will be available both on our TV channel and website. We're competing against Harry Truman's grandson tonight in the Carlson Center. You certainly have a choice of events and activities this evening. I'm glad you decided to spend your time with us. My name is James Liker, Professor of History, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this, the inaugural address of the Kansas Lecture Series. For what we hope will be years to come, the series will bring to campus prominent individuals whose life work showcases core issues that concerns all Kansans. Coordination of the lecture series is one of the functions of the Kansas Studies Institute at Johnson County Community College. The institute promotes research and teaching on the cultures, art, economics, and natural environment of Kansas. This is accomplished through frequent tours for staff, faculty, and visitors, a series of adult classes offered in the continuing education program, curriculum development and student internships, and the building of collegial relationships with colleges and universities across the state. I invite you all to return to the Hudson Auditorium on Wednesday, April 7th, for the premiere of a film on folk artist M.T. Liggett, produced by the Kansas Studies Institute. Stay tuned for future developments as we explore the state's past legacies and future challenges and what both of those will mean for us here in Johnson County. Introducing our speaker is my friend and colleague, Dr. Jay Antle. An associate professor of history, Dr. Antle joined the full-time faculty of JCCC in 2000 and has taught courses in United States and Kansas history. A specialist in the history of the environment, he now serves as the college's executive director for sustainability. Appropriate then that he should introduce Dr. Jackson. Please join me in welcoming Jay Antle. Uh, wow. You, well, first of all, those of you who are standing up or in the overflow room, you aren't really here to listen to me, so I'm going to speed this up, all right? That's okay with you all. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm very, uh, very happy to be introducing uh, Wes Jackson. And if you're here, you, you know much about Wes Jackson and his work. Uh, but I think it's very important to look at the audience out here. How many of you are students of one type or another? Please raise your hand. Give yourselves a hand. You know, here at Johnson County Community College, our goal is to, uh, is to encourage lifelong learning. And uh, this sort of an event in which we reach out to uh, people who are in public schools, our students here, people who are perhaps are you know, lifelong learners in their 40s and 50s and retirement. Isn't retirement lifelong learning, right? Isn't that part of that too? Uh, well, welcome. And uh, this evening will be an interesting uh, uh, talk. Uh, Wes is always, always interesting and will challenge us in various ways tonight. I'll give you a basic bio uh, about Wes. He, of course, is the uh, intrepid leader of the Land Institute out in Salina, Kansas, where they are trying to do nothing more than overturn the fundamental way in which agriculture is done in this country. Yeah. No one can accuse Wes of, of not being ambitious. Um, he earned his bachelor's in biology from Kansas Wesleyan University, his master's in botany from KU, and a PhD in genetics from North Carolina State University. Uh, he established and served as chair as one of the country's first environmental studies programs at California State University, Sacramento, and then he decided it was time to come back to the Plains, uh, where he founded the Land Institute in 1976. He has uh, published a number of books and articles, including, of course, New Roots for Agriculture and Becoming Native to This Place, widely recognized as one of the most important minds, uh, not just in this country, but in the world today, as witnessed by his awarding of a MacArthur Fellowship in 1992. Uh, the Wright Livelihood Award, sometimes called the Alternative no Nobel Prize in 2000. Life Magazine has called him one of the most uh, important Americans of the 20th century. The Smithsonian in 2005 called him 35, what if 35 made a difference? You get the point here. 
Uh, but perhaps more to the point, uh, Rolling Stone magazine <laughs> uh, recently named him as one of the most important Americans in the country who's making a difference. And uh, earlier during dinner, and I can't explain how this worked, but we actually managed to link uh, West and his work to a Lady Gaga video. <laughs> Lifelong learning. Uh, with that said, and hopefully a little bit of fun, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Wes Jackson. Well, thank you, Jay. Um, well, it's, um, it's to get over, good to get over here in the eastern part of the state and uh, get amongst the living. Um, um, we uh, out in Salina mostly just sit around and hurt <laughs> until we can come over here and get, you know, our tires aired up and whatever. <laughs> so how are things anyway, huh? A lot going on here. Uh, I was impressed at dinner by the food <laughs> and by the spirited uh, effort at local food, good food, organic food. Um, this uh, college is to be praised for all of that. And by the way, that's not part of my prepared remarks. I had no idea so much was going on, uh, which tells me I need to get out of town once in a while, <laughs> come over here and find out what's going on. Well, I gave a title several months ago, <clears throat> um, What We Need to Know to Meet the Sustainability Challenges of the Next Half Century. Uh, and. Uh, so I've been working hard on this talk, and I hope you people appreciate how hard I've worked on this talk, uh, because um, I, I am going to go through a very carefully constructed outline and do what my wife probably says, said I would do, is try to tell everybody too much. Um, but. So if you'll bear with me, and if there's a point when you, there's something you don't understand or follow, um, don't interrupt. <laughs> <clears throat> well, first of all, where are we? I mean, I don't mean in Kansas and in Johnson County. Where are we as a species, uh, as a culture? as Americans, as Kansans. Well, we have things happening in the economy, but this is not like the Great Depression during the Roosevelt era. That's number one. Um, we still had resources, lots of them. We had fewer people, a third as many. We were less spoiled because we were six times less affluent. Whatever economy recovery we have is really going to be kicking the can down the road. That's number one. Number two, we're living within a 120 year window, 1930 is the beginning of that window. I picked that date because anyone who died by 1930 had never lived through a doubling of the human population. 120 years later, in 2050, anyone born after that time likely won't either. So what has happened since 1930? Well, the world population tripled. It doubled since Kennedy. Death control, which goes with the grain, 
while birth control tends to go against the grain, death control has been more effective, antibiotics and other things causing us to live longer. From 1960 to 2000, within that 120 year window that's part of our focus tonight, we had a green revolution and a two and a half fold increase in the food supply. <clears throat> 21 years before uh, 1930, we had the most important invention of the 20th century. But we didn't, it didn't really kick in until after about 1950. And that was two Germans, Fritz Haber and Karl Bosch, learned how to turn into atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. It's one of the strongest bonds in nature. And we use natural gas as the feedstock to do that. And Vaclav Smil, who studied nitrogen all his uh, academic life, contends that without the Haber-Bosch process, 40% of humanity wouldn't be here today. 40% of us are derived from that Haber-Bosch process. Well, that's 21 years before 1930, but as I said, it didn't kick in until after around 1950 or later. Well, what is, uh, what we find 71 years before 1930, in 1859, was Drake's oil well in western Pennsylvania. Um, in 1930, now this is 71 years after Drake's oil well, of the, all the oil burned to date, by 1930, less than 1% was burned in that first 71 years. Now, <clears throat> that's number two. We're living within a 120-year window. So it's not just the explosion of the human population. There are other population problems. The population of deep freezes has gone up. The population of pop-up toasters has gone up. The population of cars has gone up. The population of airplanes, TV sets, computers have exploded. That population explosion has been faster than the explosion in human numbers. And as an economic aggregate, there's been a six-fold increase in that, those materials, the houses, the cars, the TVs, the toasters, and so on. And it's worth remembering that these populations, like humans, deer, hawks, owls, turkeys, all of these accoutrements of civilization um, all are dissipative structures. They are all subject to the second law of thermodynamics. All, they, all things wear out. So, yes, we have a population problem. Too many houses and toasters and too many humans and cows and pigs and chickens. Um, on planet Earth. That's number three. Remember what I'm talking about, number one is where are we? We're in the midst of a population explosion. That's number three. Number four, we have a lot of talk today that what we need to do is get more efficient and more efficient in the use of energy. And yes, we do. But we tend not to be as mindful as we should about Jevons' paradox. William Stanley Jevons, 
an English economist in 1865 published a book after a thoroughgoing study of industrial England and William Stanley Jevons concluded that as industrial England got more efficient in its technology, industrial England used more resources. It frees up capital. So as long as you have growth, then your efficiency will help foster that growth. It is, it, it, as I say, frees up capital. So that's number four, Jevons' paradox. Number five, I think we suffer from what we might call technological fundamentalism, uh, which is worse than any form of religious fundamentalism. Uh, the belief that human cleverness will solve the problem with gadgets or a pill. And this idea tends to come with the milk. It's deep. Uh, we are gadgety species. Number six, the scaffolding of civilization producing and supporting the efficiency technology Things like hybrid cars, computers, photovoltaic panels, wind machines, the, what I call the scaffolding that's necessary for that. Roads, bridges, high-rise buildings, people running off to board meetings, <laughs> capital being trade, traded. That scaffolding of civilization, the energy cost for that cannot be estimated with great accuracy. So when we talk about being carbon neutral or carbon negative, we better be careful what we're talking about because chances are we don't know what we're talking about. Now this is not to say we don't try to get more efficient. This is not to say we don't use technology. This is to say that we've got to move to a different level of analysis of our situation. Number seven, the speed of change. We have little intuition for the power of the exponential. I used to as an exercise when I was teaching in university, have the students start with two, and I say, I'm going to give you five seconds. Tell me what two raised to the fifth power is, quick. They essentially all fail. <laughs> we don't have the ability to think about four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 10, 24. You see, and it goes like that. Well, we are living in a world in which the exponential is a part of the big reality. So um, the speed of change has come on so fast, the 10-year-old Living today has lived through a quarter of all the oil ever burned. Most of you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> the 22 year old, and there are some of you in here, have lived through 54% of all the oil ever burned, going back to 1859. Now, I'm 73, and in my first 22 years, my cohorts and I lived through 16% of the amount that the current 22-year-old is living through. Number eight, the power of cultural and regional history 
seems to be greater than the power of education. Um, we could go back to the assumptions of the Enlightenment around 1600. Bacon, Descartes, Galileo, Newton. I've told this before. Uh, my children at the meal table uh, when they were growing up. They all raised and have children now, and so they're getting even for me. Um, they would say, uh, now, Dad, can you explain it? But this time, not go back to the Big Bang. Uh, uh, and so I'm not going to the Big Bang, but if we go back to 1600, uh, considerably this side of the Big Bang, we had the architects of the Enlightenment that were Francis Bacon, but Rene Descartes, Galileo, um, and Copernicus kind of set a lot of that off. Um, they believe that the way you get at truth is to break a problem down. It's reductive to be, to reduce a problem down to the smallest point. Well, of course, at the point, in which there is no ambiguity, it's at that point, it's totally irrelevant. <laughs> so our founding fathers, uh, Jefferson, Franklin, John Adams, they were all devotees of the Enlightenment. And um, how is it that there is such denial in Kansas and Missouri about uh, climate change? What is it? something less than half, and in spite of the fact that some 2,000 scientists that publish in refereed journals on the issue, and by the way, there's one way academics get standing, it's by finding something wrong with another academic. <laughs> now, that's the way you rise. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's brutal but it's also necessary. Well, and I want to tell a little story. I told this at dinner, where I had a very nice meal, by the way. <laughs> uh, steak as thick as that, from bison. And some funny colored potato that was an heirloom variety, no doubt. But it was a wonderful organic dinner, and uh, and I would clap for it now, but those of you that didn't get in on it wouldn't know why I'm <laughs> clapping. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, Dick Lewington at Harvard, a well-known geneticist, and Carl Sagan, the astronomer, um, were evolutionary biologists. And many years ago, 25, 30, they went to, I think, Arkansas to a church-related college to debate a zoologist who had done his PhD out of the University of Texas, and, but the zoologist was a creationist. And uh, it was in, I think his, the zoologist's father was the president of the church-related college or something like that. Anyway, um, they asked for a show of hands after the debate. And the creationists won. So going back in the cab to the airport, Carl Sagan says to Dick Lewington, well, this is obviously a problem of education. And Dick Lewington says, it's cultural and regional history. What is it about cultural and regional history that keeps us from taking the best out of the Enlightenment. So that's number eight, and that's where we are. That's one of the places that we are. And then number nine, what I call the 3.45 billion year imperative. <laughs> uh, you don't have to write that down. Uh, if you want to leave it at three billion to round it off, it's all right. But what we're talking about is back when life, 
where we have evidence that life began. And all life creatures are carbon-based. Because of the carbon bond, remember in your periodic chart of the elements, you got, you got a little line going this way and a line going that way and a line going up and a line going down. That means there are four places where it can bond. Carbon is a good thing to organize life around. Well, um, being carbon-based creatures, that's where the energy is stored. And so, if you're a bacterium on a petri dish where there's sugar, which is energy-rich carbon, you just grow. If you're a drosophila fly, drosophila flies in a flask, you just expand your numbers. You got plenty of mashed up bananas in there and some yeast. Or uh, if you're an elephant on the Serengeti and you don't have anything that's going to eat you or bring you down like hunters or whatever, we go after energy rich carbon. Now at the ecosystem level, uh, things are eating other things. But once you become a species out of context and you don't have predators like you used to. In other words, uh, imagine us in Africa before our walk out of Africa around a campfire. There were things that would eat us. In fact, I could do an experiment right now, <laughs> but I'm not going to do it. I used to do this though is have a class, maybe about this size, and then have some person come walking down the side very quietly. And, you know, heads turn. And then I would be lecturing away and say, now, did you hear what I said? No, they didn't, because the surrogate hyena <laughs> would snap up a kid in that Paleolithic setting. We're still creatures of the upper Paleolithic. Now, that was a digression. Now, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> uh, so, what, what I'm getting at is the 3.45 billion year imperative, we go after energy rich carbon. And when about 10,000 years ago, Somewhere in the Zagros Mountains of Western Iran, somebody found some wheat that jump-started civilization, but to grow that wheat out meant that you had to till the soil. And as they did unwittingly, they were getting at the young pulverized coal of the soil. It was the first getting at something that would eventually lead to sustenance and health and it made civilization possible. And this, that's the first pool. The second pool, about 5,000 years ago, using forests to smelt the ore that give us, gave us the Bronze Age and later the Iron Age the second pool of energy rich carbon. Not only do we have an endogenous taking in carbon, but as a technological creature, it's exogenous. We will get what we can. So the first pool gave us civilization. It gave us, um, it gave us the ancients, you know, about the time, well, writing comes along. So, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, and then 250 years ago is all, is coal. And without soil carbon, forest carbon, coal, we would have never had Darwin. The slack that was available to the British Empire to send a man, a naturalist, on, void, on, a, on a voyage around the world. And then to have the slack for him to pour over his specimens for a long time while others were using the coal and the forests and the soil to create that slack 
his wife was a Wedgwood, came out of the Wedgwood potters. They had slack. It was also his first cousin. Um, he married well. <laughs> All right, so then comes Drake's oil well, a little over 100 years after the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And then, well, we had had natural gas like 1815, but not really for power source. Actually, natural gas, I do feel another digression coming on. <laughs> uh, natural gas goes back at least to the oracle at Delphi, where when you're around it, what it'll do is change the sound of your voice. And so, you know, if you're sitting up there and somebody like Croesus comes to you that wants to make war against the Persians and he consults the oracle at Delphi, and the oracle at Delphi is used to being ambiguous, and he says if you make war against the Persians, a great kingdom's going to fall. Well, Croesus made war against the Persians, a great kingdom fell, his. Uh, that's the thing about the oracular tradition, uh, and if it hadn't been for natural gas, uh, back there at the time of uh, 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 when, when, the, when the ancient Greeks were at work, well, I don't know what would have happened. Uh, well, we would have been stuck with the prophetic tradition, uh, <laughs> such as we had among the Hebrews. Uh, I throw all that in for no extra charge. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, now number 11. We've got the power to create abstractions. And those abstractions, if they find a particularity, and we developed an economic system for being good at getting at energy-rich carbon and the accoutrements of civilization that that carbon makes available. It's called capitalism but it's petri dish economics. How can we get to the edge of the petri dish? Of course, we don't think about the petri dish having an edge because we live on a big planet and we didn't have many people. And so we could do it. So, and now I think I'm about finished with, uh, oh, I have 12. You always have to have 12. Um, a professor friend of mine is dead now, Dan Luton. He was at UC Berkeley. And he had a wonderful, I think, way of putting it. He said, we came as a poor people to a seemingly empty land that was rich in resources. And we built our institutions for that perception of reality our political institutions, our economic institutions, our social institutions, our educational institutions, even our religious institutions are predicated on the underlying assumption of poor people in an empty land that's rich. Well, now we've become rich people in an increasingly poor land that's filling up including the sinks. So the source, the oil, the coal, the natural gas, the forests, and now the sink. And now those institutions don't hold. And that's why I almost weep for the young that have got to figure out how to make this transition without widespread social upheaval. How do we do it, given the liability of cultural and regional history? You know, given these institutional structures, well, it used to be that if you wanted to improve the economy by improving yourself, 
you, and you were a fisherman, you would build a fishing boat. And you keep building fishing boats and the economy goes up. But what happens as the catch declines and the reproductive rate of the fish decline to build more boats, you see, is not the way to go. But that's what we have had so far in the great experiment. Or another way is drill more oil wells, put in more rigs. Well, that's fine before you get peak oil or even a little after. So what do we do then? Well, we build bigger ships and we put in 50 mile drift nets and we get as many fish as we can. So where are we? That was the question that I was dealing with in those 12. Well now it seems to me um, given those 12 considerations, it seems worth a study of the exits. And I uh, have a long history of studying exits. I just broke my glasses. That's so like me. I don't know what I'm going to do. Anybody got any glasses? I could hold my hand over one eye, but that'd appear eccentric. Uh, let's see. Lost a hearing aid, too. <laughs> Let's work, hope this works. No, this is the worst kind of glasses you could have. <laughs> Raymond, this isn't going to do it. Somebody else out there. Uh, I think we can make this work. <laughs> Uh, you're the one that I, who, who's, yeah. all right, uh, you have free membership in the Land Institute. <laughs> Just don't forget to send a donation. <laughs> okay, so um, we need to study the exits. And uh, sustainability has been out there for some time now. And a good concept, I think, is the word sustainability. A lot of people have attacked it. But um, the thing is that it's a value term. People say, well, give me a definition of sustainable and give me a good example. And my answer is, give me a good definition of justice and give me a good example. You can't do it. Those are value terms. And we kind of know it when we see it. But that's the way value terms are. So I don't want to see the term go away. For one thing, it didn't come out of government. It came out of the people. And uh, so organic gardening and farming, community supported agriculture, the slow food movement, local food movement, those are all term, all, all motivations out of the idea of sustainability. Well now added to it in very recent times over the last couple of decades uh, is another term or another expression, it's called resilience thinking. And what recommends resilience thinking is that there is a kind of a formalization that's developing. It started with, I think, Buzz Hollings at the University of Florida at Gainesville. And resilience thinking is, is something like this. I'm not going to go into it very much, but this ugly um, figure up here. It is ugly. It was taken out of a textbook. Um, I don't mean textbooks are ugly. It's just the way it came out. But 
you're going to see this figure eight a lot as we think about resilience. What is resilience? It's sort of like uh, one writing a preface to the book, small book, Resilience Thinking, and the larger book is Panarchy by Hollings and somebody with a Swedish name. Um, let's say that you have a glass of water and you want to carry, and you're on a boat in a harbor and you want to carry it across to a stateroom and you're in the harbor and you can get across as fast as you can without spilling the water. But if you're out on the ocean and you're wanting to deliver that water to a stateroom, you don't just get across there as fast as you can. You know where you can grab hold of something or you, you're able to flex your knees. That's resilience. The way we have run our world is as though we're in a harbor and we just try to get there as fast as we can without thinking about how do we keep the water from spilling. So that is a somewhat more complicated uh, concept than sustainability and it's developing a, a mathematical language actually. Uh, so it's something you may want to look into those two books. One's called Panarchy and the other is called uh, uh, Resilience Thinking. It's a thin book and those are my kind of books. So um, now, where do we find economies that are resilient? Well, alpine meadows, tropical rainforests, deciduous forests, prairies. These are all resilient economies and there's nothing phony about them. They feature material recycling, they run on contemporary sunlight, and they in most cases actually build soil or ecological capital. So if we're to think about an economy that's not an extractive economy, we need to be thinking about where the good examples are. So I'm saying let's look to nature's economies. And the, my friend Chuck Washburn, a uh, good number smith friend that I taught with in California, he just had a sentence he uttered once. He says, if we don't get sustainability in agriculture first, it's not going to happen. And then he went on. He said, agriculture ultimately has the discipline of ecology and evolutionary biology standing behind it. The industrial sector has no discipline to draw on. The materials sector doesn't have a discipline to draw on. So the look to nature's economies uh, and agriculture is where the break with nature began in the first place. So we have to eat. And if we can keep ourselves fed, we can work our way out of other areas by using our efforts to get the agricultural economy in synchrony with nature's economy. So here is, oh, and I got a way to illustrate that. Uh, when we were hunters and gatherers, we were embedded within the system. Then we developed what we call traditional agriculture and we moved somewhat out of phase. And then in the industrial world we got even more out of phase. So what's next? Well we're not um, in a very cheerful sort of way going back to gathering and hunting again. Probably not to traditional agriculture. Um, so what? Well we can build an agriculture based on the way nature's ecosystems work and get more in phase. And that, now imagine, let's say here we are now with the industrial and here we are with nature's economy. And here's the industrial agricultural economy. Imagine now 
we get in phase, in some kind of a dynamic equilibrium. And then we turn that and say, okay, what are the thermodynamic processes going on within that system that we can use as analogs for a different economic order? That, it seems to me, is a place to begin. And, but we've got to, first of all, start with agriculture, and there's another good reason. You know, we may, we may find some technological substitutes for coal and oil and natural gas through wind machines, photovoltaic panels, and so on, but there's no technological substitute for soil. So if we can save the soil and save the water through an agriculture that is not of a erosive kind, then we can get through this long tunnel of decline in population and reduce the extractive economy down to something that's manageable. So what we find in natural ecosystems is a tight cycling of nutrients and water, symbiotic relationships among members of the biota, actually build soil, and here's the key, they are all intensive information systems. If you were to walk into a prairie and decide that you were going to have a bunch of people type up the DNA sequences of all those species that are out there, that information in a, in a, a few acres would fill more than all the libraries of the world. But we plowed that under. We plowed that under for a simpler information system and then we substituted energy to offset the loss of what that information system was doing. Let me stop there. You understand? You want me to run that by again? <laughs> It's, it's, I mean, if, is there somebody out there that's got courage enough to hold up their hand and say, I want you to do it again? <laughs> okay, good. A whole bunch of them go up, pop up like toast. Um, <laughs> see, here's the thing. Imagine you got information on one end and you got energy on the other. And out here where you have information, you got cultural and you got biological. All right, when you're, you destroy a rural culture with the know-how to grow food, you've destroyed cultural information. But you have a lot of fossil energy. So your information goes down, but your, your energy goes up. So this explains to me why, all right, but look at a prairie you've got more biological information than you do cultural. When you plow it, you've got to depend more on the cultural, and it can't offset what's been lost with the biological, and so you bring on a lot of fossil energy. So a future agriculture will have a high eyes to acres ratio more people watching the landscape and using uh, their wits. But we will also be bringing more biological information into the system. Now, here's where I'm going to just spend a little bit of time telling you about our uh, research at the Land Institute. Essentially, all of nature's <coughs> ecosystems, essentially all, feature perennials, which means they come up from the roots every year, grown in mixtures. And 10,000 years ago, agriculture began to reverse that. And we have annuals in monocultures. Perennials have an excess capacity that can be reallocated to grain production. So what we're doing is here it happens to be sorghum. We're perennializing sorghum and making it winter hardy. And here you can see 
the perennial sorghum on the left in early June is up and going. The annual has hardly broken, broken through. And over on the right in July, it's still ahead. It's capturing more sunlight. The perennial is capturing more sunlight than the annual. And uh, we're also perennializing sunflower. Um, and here's some of our perennial wheat that has been harvested, and here come the shoots in the greenhouse. And just to show you the, um, the distance, here you plant wheat, the annual wheat in September. Here is an intermediate wheat grass plant. Here it is December, you can see it growing a little. Here's the perennial. Here it is in March, here's the perennial. Here it is in June. And now, just to show you, um, this is a one-to-one -one representation of what I just showed you. Wow. You see the wheat is at the bottom, and the perennial wheat uh, at the top. It's actually Kernza. Um, which is a species that we've essentially domestic that are domesticating. Um, so, and by the way, that's that's as I said, one to one. Now, um, also, uh, thank you. Um, And here is that plant that you just saw, the, the Kernza plant growing out in our plots. We just planted 126 acres of that just a few weeks ago. Uh, and here are some hybrids between the perennial wheat and the annual, the perennial on the right, the annual on the left, the hybrid in the middle. Uh, sorghum, crossing sorghum with a wild species. Uh, Illinois bundle flower is a legume that we th uh, that has a nutritional profile that's not too different than uh, soybean, and soybean is now the number one killer of the continent. Um, well, there's more soil erosion with soybeans than corn. Corn used to be the primary killer. Uh, and here's some of our young scientists at work making crosses. Uh, oh, this is the, the annual sunflower on the left, the perennial on the right. Uh, also, uh, species of silpium that we're domesticating. And <coughs> here is corn. 70 million acres a couple of years ago, up to 90 million acres because of the Nutty Biofuels Program. <laughs> and then uh, soybean, about the same. Now think of this, 328 million acres, roughly 140 or 150 million acres devoted to those two crops. I mean, this is nuts. Uh, this is not diversity. So uh, in the upper Midwest, now the soils are bare in April. Um, that brown, that means those fields, that's when the rains are coming. That's when the water's coming off the Gulf of Mexico. That's when, uh, you know, they need to be getting seeds in the ground. And here you can see they now have minimum till or no till, nice clear water. Here you have it without minimum till and milky water. And we say, okay, well this is what we will do. We'll have minimum till, no till, and we'll put on the herbicide. Well, that water has more nitrogen in it, three times the nitrogen that's acceptable out of the Environmental Protection Agency. So here we try a trick to have minimum till, no till, and you may get clearer water, but you also got more nitrogen. So annuals are poor uh, managers of nutrients and water. Well, look at those roots. I mean, imagine that wimpy little root down there trying to do the job. And it's not there year round. So as a consequence, in, we have a dead zone at the end of the Mississippi River. Um, so, as a consequence, a little over a year ago, a year and a half ago now, um, we decided that we needed, instead of having a five-year farm bill, we needed a 50-year farm bill. And so, um, a few of us went to work and looked at, first of all, what, 
five-year farm bills are about. Exports, commodities, subsidies, some soil conservation measures, and the food programs. We don't object to food programs. We don't object to soil conservation measures. Uh, <clears throat> but a 50-year farm bill would be a program in which we'd use five-year farm bills as mileposts, adding larger, more sustainable end goals to existing programs. So um, here's what a 50-year farm bill would look like. Protect soil, cut fossil fuel dependence to zero, sequester carbon, reduce toxics in soil and water, manage nitrogen carefully, reduce dead zones, cut wasteful water use, and preserve or rebuild farm communities. So look at the comparison. One is an extractive economy that uh, when every time you, any time you got exports and commodities, then food is available to become a weapon. And so, and it requires subsidies in order to keep that system going. Here, over here, the reward goes to the farmer and the landscape rather than the suppliers of inputs. Here, the reward goes primarily to the suppliers of inputs. I mean, how do you know when you got a farm crisis? It's when the banks are in trouble. <laughs> That's when you got a farm crisis. Uh, I mean, look to see who goes in and out with suits on into those rooms in the Capitol and in the Senate office building, the House office building. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of money being thrown at this and hardly any at that. So a 50-year farm bill would draw attention to the supply side. Now, here's something that the Californians don't know. Here's something that the people from the Northeast don't know that are working in the area of sustainable agriculture, community-supported agriculture and all that. What they don't know is that roughly three-quarters of the calories that they consume are grains and cereals and oil seeds, and it's about the same acreage. So look here, tree crops, sugar crops, other crops, vegetables. Here is where most of the sustainable ag movement is. And that's something we got to address. I've got a bet. I bet a Californian $10 that 70% of the calories that Californians eat come over the Sierra Nevada. There's also good data now that knew that, uh, you know Cuba? After Cuba got, uh, the Soviet Union went down and Castro got 80,000 steers and found some men that could train oxen instead of two buses into the countryside a day, one a week, a rural economy is developing, they've got organic, they've got everything going and I've had more invitations to go to Cuba and look at that success of what happened with the bringing down of the wall. Well, just two weeks ago, I saw the data. U.S. Department of Agriculture and Canada Agriculture. What percent of the calories do you suppose Cuba imports? 80%. And here was the example we were all talking about. This is where the next level of the sustainable ag movement has to go to start addressing that particular uh, reality. Here it is for the United States. Uh, that's global. So it isn't that much different, global versus U.S. Well, here's corn in Iowa after a rain. But there's our prairie in Kansas after a rain. The difference, annual, 
and monoculture, perennial and polyculture. This is the agriculture we can build by perennializing the major crops and mimicking the vegetative structure of that uh, system. So what we're about is to, down below, you see human cleverness. There we are perennializing the major crops. Right in the foreground here is our never plowed native prairie that Zebulon Pike saw in 1806, just as it was then, or pretty close. So try to imagine growing corn on that slope. So here is the bill. And we'll take our time. This is 2009. And about 323 million acres U.S. being accounted for here. There's actually about 400 million, but we got some in the CRP and some other things. So here's the focus. Now if you look at right down here, we have various kinds of an annuals. And then in here is mostly the corn, the wheat, the sorghum, the soybeans, and so on. And then from here up are pastures or perennials being grown as a part of a rotation. So what we're asking for is a subsidy in this farm bill. We took this to the Secretary of Agriculture and to the deputy and so on. We're asking for an increase in the perennials and the rotation over the next five years. More increase, more increase. And then about here, this little part right there, that's when our perennial grains begin to come online. And we increase those, and we increase those, and we increase those, and we increase those, and we increase those. Now if you note, we're also increasing the trees, tree crops, and we're increasing the vegetables. We're doubling that. So we're moving from 80% annuals, 20% perennials, to the other way around over a 50-year period. That is the plan. Now we can do that. What's it going to take? It's going to take about 80 PhD level geneticists and about uh, 30 ecologists. We're asking that for USDA um, and 50 million a year. 50 million a year. And we could transform agriculture. Well, because my glasses came apart, I'm going to move on here. <laughs> so we can have production at the expense of conservation, or we can have conservation at the expense of production. That's the way it is now. In other words, you, you save the wild biodiversity uh, and intensify on the ag land. Well, and not so fast. Because, you know, here's the good ag land that is considered the profane, whereas the wild biodiversity is considered the sacred. So, what about conservation as the consequence of production? And that's what we could have with an agriculture based on the way nature's ecosystem works. I'll tell you what the Land Institute is going to be spending more time on. There is a, a long history of featuring human cleverness with the idea that nature is to be subdued or ignored. And as a consequence of that history, we now have in high places, in Washington now, someone closely aligned with Monsanto 
closely aligned with the agribusiness concerns that are now positioned to give us more biotechnology to meet the food needs of the future. So if we imagine the human cleverness end here, and the nature's wisdom end here, we're not ex against any this exercise of human cleverness, but it ought to be in a subordinate role to the way nature's ecosystems have worked over millions of years. So we're going to draw attention to the gains to be uh, had by looking at the efficiencies inherent within the natural integrities. The efficiencies inherent within the natural integrities of a natural ecosystem. What are some of those? Well, I'll give you this example. And my dear wife Joan tells me, don't do that um, <laughs> uh, because it's too complicated. But um, uh, I'm going to give it to you anyway because <laughs> she stayed home. Uh, <laughs> A bacterium will attach to the root of a legume plant, but it is a bacterium that cannot live in free oxygen. It attaches when it's in the, the spore stage. The root of the legume plant grows around it, and as it does, it takes the oxygen that was in this little ball. The spore form gets released, and that bacterium, an anaerobic bacterium has the ability because the oxygen is gone now it's only 40% of, or 80% of the atmosphere that's left or four-fifths of the atmosphere let's say because here's the deal 78% of the atmosphere is nitrogen and 21% is oxygen and then 1% other all right, so when the oxygen has been taken up, leaving 80% of an atmosphere at ambient temperatures, those bacteria can, with 21 enzymes, that means a lot of information, at four-fifths of an atmosphere, ambient temperature, 21 enzymes, turn atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia. Now, here's what Haber-Bosch requires, where we use natural gas. 350 atmospheres and 400 degrees C. The industrial system is inefficient. The biological system is highly efficient. Now, why aren't we working to learn as many of those efficiencies in those natural integrities as possible. We could if we would start with the nature's wisdom instead of the human cleverness. Okay, I'm going to... I'm, I'm really sorry about these glasses. Uh, um, What would it look like if we're successful? Um, we will be consciously electing to live within our ecological means for the first time since agriculture began. And we will retain what we have gained from the five pools which sponsored civilization. Look what we gained from those five pools. We got civilization. We are the only species that represents matter's way of having gained self-recognition. We know we're made of atoms. We also now know that we're products of a dying star, that we've been cycled through a supernova at least twice, 
that the carbon which enters our bodies was cooked in that remote past of that dying star. We have a pretty good idea of the age of the universe now. We know that from that, uh, from that carbon came nitrogen and these other indispensable elements were spewed out into space to mix and form planets and eventually we ourselves. We now know that the ancient seas set the pattern of ions in our blood. Gathers and hunters didn't know that. And the ancient atmospheres molded our metabolism. I mean, we know we're products of the simian line. We have a pretty good idea of where we come from and what kind of a thing are we. Now the big thing is, right at this moment, when we got Tate plate tectonics, we got the Hubble telescope, we've got all of this. Is this the very moment that we are unable to get a grip on what we must do in order to keep all of this? Well, T.S. Eliot and Little Gidding said this in the last of the four quartets. We shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Know the place for the first time. If this coming generation can bring about the most important transition, more important than our walk out of Africa. And we can remem remember everything we learned during this 10,000 year journey sponsored by the five depleting carbon pools and live within our means. Well, what will it take to pull this off? And here's what Kenneth Clark said in his book entitled Civilization about Michelangelo's David, and this is the last I'm going to say. He says, seen by itself, the David's body might be some unusually taut and vivid work of antiquity. It is only when we come to the head of Michelangelo's David, and by the way, let me, it is only when we come to the head that we are aware of a spiritual force that the ancient world never knew. I suppose that this quality, which I may call heroic, is not a part of most people's idea of civilization. It involves a contempt for convenience and a sacrifice of all those pleasures that contribute to what we call civilized life. And yet we recognize that to despise material obstacles and even to defy the blind forces of fate is man's supreme achievement. And in the end, civilization depends on man extending his powers of mind and spirit to the utmost. We must reckon the emergence of Michelangelo as one of the great events in the history of Western man. Now that takes some unpacking, I admit. <laughs> but ignore the use of non-inclusive man. Clark published Civilization in 1969, and the word heroic refers not to the industrial hero or the hero on the battlefield. It can be a somewhat anonymous hero or the hero up against a subjugating power. Goliath was a giant and well armed and presumably experienced in conventional battle. David was young with no protective army with only, his only weapon was a slingshot and a pebble, but answering to, I will say, a heavenly source. 
David is the ecological movement, and it must make its own moments and respond by despising material obstacles and defy the blind forces of fate. If we're successful, that will become the supreme achievement of the next generation, indeed the necessary achievement of our time. And we'll fail many times. And here I can't help but mention that David, when he served as king, had a reign marked with countless failings. But in the end, the scripture said, he was a man after God's own heart. So this is a moral impulse. And I think of John Adams writing to uh, or John Adams writing to uh, Abigail uh, when he said, I think of this all the time, on July of 1776 with 37,000 British troops on Staten Island saying, you know, we may not succeed. And remember, he and all the rest of them just had publicly signed their own death warrants. He says, we may not succeed, but we can act in a manner we deserve to. I think this quiet, heroic effort, and I think I saw students here at, at dinner that are engaged in that, and some faculty that are engaged in that. That has to grow. That has to grow. This place is a great inspiration and has the potential to be even greater inspiration to a lot more young people. And. Uh, I will follow you with interest. Thank you.